right here is the path I took to get my British citizenship. It's just one path, sure, but there are many available out there, and it may seem a bit convoluted and confusing to the untrained eye, because it is. But lucky for you, in the last two years, the UK government have done a complete overhaul on their visa system. It makes way more sense now, and they've even added some amazing new visas that I would have killed for when I first moved here, because they make moving to the UK and making it your permanent home that much more simple. So, if you are interested in moving to the UK, well, strap yourselves right on in. It's time to learn about visas. No MasterCards here. This is like the one niche I've got on YouTube where no one else has got it. I'm the guy. My content is all over the place. <laughs> First up, you got the visitor visa. Pretty self-explanatory. Are you gonna visit the UK? You don't plan on working, doing anything like that? Grab yourself a visitor visa. Now, most countries don't require you have one of these. For instance, if you're an American citizen, you can just fly over to the UK, not worry about a visa at all. This one's kind of built into your passport. That being said, what is also built in is that you only have a six month stay on this visa or whether or not you have to have one. And if you overstay that six month welcome, well, that's a criminal offense and you will be deported and you will be barred re-entry. So probably best not to do that. But an incredibly important part of the visitor visa is you're not allowed to be on this visa, to be visiting the UK, and work at all for any company in the UK, paid or unpaid. And you're also not allowed to do any self-employed work, which is a bit stupid in my opinion. So many people these days have a side hustle, their hands in different pots. So for instance, if you just happen to want to maybe vlog your stay in the UK while you're here for a month or two, no, illegal. Do you want to maybe, I don't know, script a new video? No YouTubing allowed. Oh, maybe you're just a photographer and you want to open up some photos from your recent trip to Madeira. No, no. In reality, just don't go blabbing your mouth to the home office like, oi mate, this is what I'm up to. Don't do that. Just keep it mum. Mum's the word. Or mom if you're from the US. And here's where it gets fun. Did I just describe visas as fun? Yes. <laughs> so next up, we got the student visa, previously called the tier four. A much better name, student. What do you do on this one? You stood. So this one requires that you get a certificate of sponsorship from your licensed student sponsor also called university. You also must prove that you have enough money to last you the duration of your course, including for rent and food and whatnot, or at least have some loans. Important asterisk here, if you're from the US, for instance, you can get that money from US Fed loans. And if you do plan on staying permanently in the UK, you never have to pay that back. Thanks, Uncle Sam. Don't worry, it's just an IRS loophole. Now, just so I don't have to repeat myself a thousand times throughout this video, there are a few qualifications to get this visa that also apply to most visas in this video. First of which being, the English language comprehension. You have to be able to prove that you can speak it, you can comprehend it, you can write it, you can do it. It's England after all. Now to prove this, as long as you're from an English speaking country, say America, Canada, Australia, you got this one in the bag. Or if you've already got a degree at an English speaking institution in English, you've also got it. Otherwise you have to take, from what I've heard, a very difficult English test. You cannot accept public funds such as pensions and whatnot. I have never needed to collect any of those things, but just so you know. Now the student visa costs 363 pounds to apply for, which is really good compared to the later ones we're gonna be talking about today. And you do have to pay the NHS's healthcare surcharge to pay for if any accidents happen, you can now be treated. That's about 600 pounds a year, depending on how long your course is. Now, if you are on the student visa and you also wanna make a bit of spare cash, you are able to do that, but you have some strict limitations. You are able to work for any company you want, but for instance, the way that mine worked was I was able to work for 20 hours a week maximum during term time and then 40 hours a week when not. So that allowed me to work at the Urban Outfitters and Marble Arts to earn some spare change during the seasonal period of December to January when I was doing it. And then I burnt out so hard because I realized I couldn't do a master's degree and work 20 hours a week at an Urban Outfitters. It just wasn't feasible. I, God, I was having breakdowns like every day. I was like, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I did have a heart to heart with my manager before quitting. And I was like, I promise as soon as I get this degree, I'll be right back. And he was like, Evan, I swear to God, if you get a master's degree and you come to work at Urban Outfitters, I'm gonna slap you so hard. Okay. That was nice. I don't know, I'm just really committed to things. So I was like, I'll work here for the rest of my life. I'm not a quitter. Also, this is very important. You cannot work as a professional sports person. So dash those dreams of being a rugby star away, okay? You cannot do it. No sports for you. Such a bummer. Whoever made that rule, I wish I could soccer or him. I'm sorry. And under the student visa, you're not allowed to be self-employed. Yet again, this is a bit of an outdated one. I think it's trying to protect if you're like trying to start your own business to take jobs away from Brits. But in terms of like making online content, you're probably fine. But the UK home office is very weird with these rules. I once gave them a call to be like, hi, what if I bought a CD and then I wanted to sell it because I didn't want it anymore. And they were like, you're not allowed to do that. You can't make any money outside your visa. And I was like, okay, well, I just won't sell the CD then. 
rules. Think about it. I, I took money out of a British man's mouth who wanted to sell that Justin Bieber CD. Now, how long can you stay on your student visa? Well, up to five years, but pretty much just the length of your course plus six months. So for my master's degree, I was able to stay for six months after it finished in order to either get the heck out or find a job. Of course, I got a job. Now, this is the new visa that is just so amazing that exists. You can extend your student visa now for two years under the graduate visa. I would have killed for this back in the day. I just had to leave, but you guys, you can spend how much? Oh, 715 pounds. So a bit steep, sure, but this graduate visa is like one of the best I've ever seen. So first of all, in order to qualify, you must be a student on the student visa, and you just have to have a letter from your university to the home office saying, you did your course, you didn't fail, you did it. And then, Bob's your uncle, you've got the graduate visa. Well, what jobs am I allowed to have? Anything you want. You can be self-employed, save up all those logs. You can work at any UK company you want. This is a perfect way to get new immigrants that have just finished their degree to get a good job in the UK. Rather than have to work for specific sponsored companies, you can work for any company you want, get the relevant experience, any startup at all. And then after your two years is up on the graduate visa, you can switch to one of the other visas and hopefully extend to get that ILR one day. Keep, keep that in mind, we'll get to that. However, yet again, very important to note here, if you do want to get this graduate visa and you have dreams of being a rugby star, no, don't even try it. No sports person stuff here, okay? Put the cleats away. No, <laughs> no sports person stuff. No, get your relevant experience and then build that up until you can then transition into the next visa, the skilled worker visa. Yet again, a better name than the tier two that it was previously named. So for this one, you're allowed to work for any UK company as long as they are on the official UK home offices list of approved sponsors. Now this is quite a big list, but it is very frustrating if you do get a job offer from a company and then they're like, actually, we don't wanna have to go through the rigmarole of becoming a sponsor. So usually it's your best interest to just apply for jobs from companies that already are sponsors. That being said, I did have one or two companies actually get sponsor status just for me which feels nice. Depends on how good you are at your job. Now, the worst part about this visa when I was on it was just how xenophobic it was. The xenophobia was pretty much baked in. Essentially, any job that you apply for under this visa, the company has to perform the resident market labor test, meaning that they have proven that they have posted your job offer available to any British people for at least 30 days on two different job boards to show that if any British person applies for the same job and has the same qualifications as you, they take it over you. It was really horrible, a stupid system, and can you believe it's no longer a thing? You don't have to worry about that anymore. Wow, amazing. I think it is really funny that the whole Brexiteer stick was, let's bring Britain back for British people. And then in the end, the exact opposite has happened. They've opened up Britain to more foreign skilled labor. Thank God, because that was just such a horrible, horrible thing. Other important things to note, your job does have to be on the list of approved roles. So for instance, even if you're working for a giant company, for instance, uh, Alphabet, Google, and whatnot, you can't just accept a job as a masseuse. Don't care how good those hands are, they've better be coding or something because masseuse is not on the list of approved jobs. Also, you must be earning the minimum salary for this job, which is a bit of a confusing calculation. Essentially, you must be earning at least the highest of these three numbers, 25,600 pounds, 10 pound, 10 pence an hour, which is like quite a lot of work to get to that amount, or the going rate for your job. Now, this is actually a really good policy put in place to ensure that foreign skilled labor aren't coming in and driving down the salaries of actual British people. This is so you don't, for instance, pull in some Moldovan engineers and they accept a much cheaper rate than the going rate. Well, that's not very fair. And so whatever the going rate is for that role, you have to be at least that high unless 25,600 pounds is more. For instance, for my previous roles in marketing, the going rate is 24,400 pounds an hour. So basically I had to be paid 25,600 pounds as that's the highest of the three numbers. Good news for me, I got paid more, but it also meant hypothetically, the company could hire a British person at less than me but they never did, so it's Now under this visa, you're allowed to stay for up to five years, and this is the first visa we're talking about today that actually allows you to transition into the ILR, essentially the pre-citizenship, the big thing that you're working for, the indefinite leave to remain. An annoying thing about this visa though, is that if you are changing roles in a sideways direction, or if you're changing companies at any point, you do have to do the entire process again, reapplying for sponsorship, and it can be very, very annoying. Now for some specifics. So we've also got the health and care visa. This one's pretty self-explanatory. Are you a 
qualified nurse, doctor, or care worker, well, this visa is for you. All you gotta do is work for the NHS or any of the other list of health sponsors and you're pretty much good to go. And this is one of the only ones where you don't have to pay the NHS surcharge. Next up, are you incredibly talented in your field? Well, come on in. Welcome to the Global Talent Visa, previously called the Tier 1 Exceptional Talent Visa. This is by far one of the best visas you can get in the UK. However, it is also the most difficult to get. I know, I had it when it was called the Exceptionally Talented One. Well, what do you have to do to get this one? Oh my God. For me, I had to get two letters from previous CEOs of companies I worked for saying that I was the best in my field, as well as writing a giant heartfelt letter about how amazing I am and how much I'll change the UK market. Then I had to get an approval letter from the head of the entire tech industry from Tech Nation UK. And after all of that, then I can use that approval letter to go apply for the visa. Cost a bit of money as well, but the rewards are legendary. Now, even though I went through the digital tech sector, which I personally find to be the easiest of the three, if your job is more in engineering or possibly even in music or the arts, well, you'd apply to a different group. For instance, the Royal Society or the British Academy or the British Academy of Engineering. Either of those will accept as long as you can prove you're the best in your field. And there's another way of getting in as well by having a relevant award that pretty much honors you as being the best. That is also an easy way in to get an easy recommendation. Besides the flex of being able to tell people that you're a global talent, exceptionally talented in your field, the main perk of the global talent visa is you have the fastest route to get to the ILR compared to every other immigrant out there. Once you are on this visa, you only need three years of working under it in order to get the ILR status and be free of all of this nonsense. Also, you're able to work any job you want for those three years that you've got this visa, which is yet again, a really amazing thing. The main thing that makes the skilled worker visa so annoying is the fact that anytime a job goes under or you lose your job or you want to switch roles, you have to go through all that process again and it gets very annoying. With the global talent one, you can do whatever you want and you don't even have to work for any company for the first year or two. Start a business, find love and gardening. However, I do think it's very important to note if you do plan on getting that indefinite leave to remain, that ILR, if you do transition to that from the global talent visa, you must prove you have been working at the field you told them you were gonna be working in for at least 12 months of the recent 18 months. Otherwise, they say, excuse me? Says right here, uh, global talent and filthy stinking liar, get out. So that, for instance, is why I was working at a social influencer marketing agency for essentially two years of my life between 2018 and 2019. The more you know. Now this next one is brand new as of last year and it's utterly fascinating. Do you think you have high potential? Are you a high potential individual? Do you refer to yourself as an HPI? Well, the HPI visa, previously called Exceptional Promise, is for you. Essentially, if you graduated from a very prestigious university, think Ivy Leagues in the US, for instance, like Princeton or Berkeley or whatnot, well, you can actually just get this visa and work any job you want in the UK. Just come on in. This is such a good way of bringing in the best and brightest from abroad into the UK market. You can bring your partner, your dependents, you can even establish a company and be self-employed under this visa. That being said, and I know you're thinking about it, you're like, oh my gosh, this is for me. I went to Brown University and this is gonna be where I start my life. Well, you better not think about being a professional sports person because that's not allowed, okay? No, throw the dreams away. No professional sports. No, I don't care if you were the best lacrosse player on your team, okay? That's just not cricket. Now this next one is pretty much just for the incredibly upper class of society who are like, oh, I just want to visit the UK for a couple months on holiday with my family, but how am I supposed to exist without bringing my chauffeur and my personal chef and my nanny? You can get the overseas domestic worker visa for each of them. So that way they can work for up to six months in the UK. That being said, it is an up to six months one, meaning they have to leave after that. So you can't really use this one to get to the ILR or citizenship. Either way, thought it was interesting. Evan, what about that standard method of where you work for a big international company and then just transfer to the UK? Yes, used to be called tier two intra-company. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful. What do we got here? The senior or specialist worker visa global business mobility. Blah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. This one means you work for, for instance, Google in the US and you're like, please, I would love to work in London. They send you to the London base. You get this specific visa. Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. You're in the UK. However, for instance, for this specific one, you've got to be making at least 43,400 pounds a year. That's a lot of bones. So you better be a real high paid employee over there in the States. But when you do move over here, you'll get things like rights and paid holiday. So come on in, but you won't be able to bear arms anymore. So, you know, 
pros and cons. Now this next visa used to have an incredibly long name. It used to be called the not shooting ourselves in the foot with the stupid decision imaginable, shortened to Brexit visa. Uh, it's now called the seasonal worker visa. Essentially the UK market didn't have enough people to be working in horticulture and or poultry, AKA picking fruit or working with chickens, that we now ask people to pay money to pick fruits, but they have to leave within six months. Brexit, always full of fun. So you gotta spend 259 pounds to get this visa and there's no minimum salary, interesting. And also, like I said, this one does not daisy chain its way to getting your ILR, so not really a good method of moving to the UK permanently. It is seasonal after all. Oh, this one's quite new. Are you a creative person? Maybe you work in film, music, a little bit of dance. Well, you can get the creative worker visa. Now this one only allows you to stay in the UK for up to one year. So it's the shortest time period available that still allows you to chain that up to get the ILR one day, possibly from switching to another visa. But it is quite interesting. Essentially it exists for, for instance, any UK film production company wants to hire a, a dancer from abroad. They can bring you on with this specific visa and you're allowed to do many, many things. In fact, you're allowed to study on this visa. You can do a second job in the same creative field and what? Oh my, if you really want to, I, I don't see anything saying you can't. You can become an international sports person. Oh my God, maybe you're like a full-time creative person. You like do film, maybe you're a YouTuber and then you're also gonna be a part-time ultimate Frisbee player. But you could be Marquez Brownlee. You, you can be Marquez Brown in the UK, congratulations. All right, so we've made a lot of jokes about it, but there is actually finally the visa for the international sports person. This is a very protected class of people. It's a protected class of immigrant. And I'm going to use the exact words they use on the government website. If you wanna get this visa, you must be elite. You have to be elite, okay? You must be internationally established. And finally, you must play your sport at the highest level. Sounds pretty easy, right? It goes up to three years and then you can extend it up to the five, which gives you that ILR status. But yeah, I don't think anyone in my audience is necessarily going to be getting this, but there you go. Now you can finally fulfill your dreams of playing for Richmond FC. All right, now we're finally done with the work related ones. Are you a British national overseas? Like someone that lives in Hong Kong? Well, you can get the British national overseas visa, very easy one to get. Or you've got the UK ancestry visa. As long as you can prove that one of your grandparents was a UK citizen living in the UK, you can get the UK ancestry visa. And that allows you to live in the UK for up to five years, which is amazing because after that five year period ends, you can apply for your ILR. So the UK ancestry visa is by far the easiest way of getting UK citizenship, but not really available to most people unless you just happen to have that relative. Next up is the family visa, or as I like to call it, marriage for visa land. You can't just come to the UK as a visitor for six months, find the man of your dreams, fall in love and get the family visa and move on in and become a citizen. No, 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 no. You, you actually legally can't do that. They've prevented you. You cannot switch from the visitor visa to the family visa. They only want true love here, guys. That being said, I do know two Americans who moved to the UK and married a British man for five years to sneak their way into the ILR status before divorcing him. So if you do plan on going this route, be sure to lead your man on for at least five years before breaking his heart. Make sure you get the ILR status first. That being said, to go the marriage route, you must be able to prove you've been living together and married for at least two years. And the marriage or civil partnership must be recognized within the UK. And you must be able to prove all of this beyond a shadow of a doubt, whether that be from tenancy agreements, shared bank statements, that sort of thing. However, on the official UK government website, it says you cannot prove your relationship with evidence such as greetings cards or social media statuses. So that greetings card you have saying, I love my fiance, isn't going to cut it this time. However, even if none of these things are true, you might still be able to apply for the family visa as long as the qualification exists that it would breach your human rights to the UK if they kicked you out. So, yeah. And finally, we've made it to the creme de la crap, citizenship light, the ILR, indefinite leave to remain. This is what we've all been working towards. Essentially, to get this one, you must have been working in the UK for at least five years. Unless you're on the global talent visa, then that means you only have to be working for three years or collectively have been living in the UK legally for at least 10 years. Also, you must be making at least 25,600 pounds a year, because I guess, no pores allowed. And throughout this whole experience, you better have been learning about the UK because it's now finally time to pass that dreaded life in the UK test. I read the life in the UK book about two times and then took about 50 different practice tests and I passed it on my first go. It was a bit difficult though. If you wanna see me actually take one of the practice tests, you can click this link above at about six minutes is when I start it. I start by telling you about my journey. Some people got really upset in the comments like, when's the test start? I don't know, I just, 
I don't know, I'm just making a video about my life, man. However, out of all of the different visas and all of the different costs, this one absolutely takes a biscuit. 2,400 pounds. Ooh, wow. However, it is the best. With indefinite leave to remain, you can work for any company you want. You can be self-employed. You can be a professional sports person. You can do anything you want. You're no longer tied down. And for all intents and purposes, you've got all of the benefits of citizenship without like the voting rights and whatnot. But I know what you want. You want to get that full citizenship. And so next up, citizenship. The only thing you got to do to get this, have the ILR for 12 months. Okay, that sounds pretty easy. And Make sure you've not traveled a huge amount in the last 12 months, or last five years rather. As long as you haven't traveled more than 450 days of the last five years, or 90 days in the last year, you can get it. You have to write an incredibly detailed list of every time you've entered and exited the UK. And as a travel vlogger, who just uploaded some vlogs from Finland, it was very difficult for me to do that. Also, one of the things you need to make sure that you are to get the citizenship is be of good character. That That's actually, that's part of it. You have to be of good character. That's how you know I'm a good guy. I got the citizenship. You also need a letter from two referees, one of which has to be of a professional British person. So for instance, a solicitor or an accountant or my Luke, my Luke, my Luke ended up being one of my referees because he is the director of his own limited company. And that was enough to prove that he was a real British person and can vouch that I'm now a real British man. And it's that simple. Just one more fee of 1,330 pounds and you gotta stare at a picture of the queen or probably the king now while they play the national anthem. Do I have to look at her while we sing it? and then Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt, you are now a British citizen. If you'd like to watch my actual journey of becoming a British citizen, including my ceremony, well, you can click the link over there. Hopefully you got a lot out of this video, and if you are interested in moving to the UK, it proved to be educational. Otherwise, I wish you the best of luck. Hopefully I get to see you in the UK soon. See you next Sunday. See you next Sunday. Cons. Cons.